development. Some of them uh, are meant to just kind of stimulate economic development or, or more health, or healthier nutrition or agritourism, agritourism or just um, a food security. Um, and many of them have these unintended consequences of a first transforming um, Bedouins uh, collective memories and their connection to the land that was um, that was um, that was um, changing uh, over the years in which they were either unrecognized or deprived of all the rights that connect them to place while they have education and health rights many of them don't have access to water sewage uh, electricity um, and uh, we know about house demolitions and things like this so as they are uh, denied these rights there that that connect them to the place these projects um, as unintended consequences many, many times transform the relationship uh, with the state in many ways, uh, and also um, uh, transform their relationship with their old, their old relationship with the land. And also uh, we suddenly see communities who have new expertise, new um, kind of critical, we call it critical sustainability, but really environmental uh, identities um, that are, um, so there are communities that are really um, a, a very conscious of their, cons of their consumptions, of water consumption and energy consumptions, and, and they explore all the new uh, methods of working the land. And uh, this is uh, why we uh, gathered here today so this is a very special session uh, uh, to me because first and foremost, because most of the people that we invite here um, have a really broad perspective of uh, either, I mean, these are perspectives that connect, bring together food education, food sovereignty, people struggle for land and for land rights and farming legacies um, of indigenous people. And we are going to think together how it all connects to um, in our context into dry lands and climate change. So on the one hand, we have uh, communities um, that because of their rights deprivation, they're really, really vulnerable to um, climate change. And here we talk about climate justice more than just climate change. And on the other hand, we really see uh, communities uh, that offer um, something that we maybe call critical sustainability and critical education. And by critical education, we address both the urgency of the term and also um, the theory that we bring to this session. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about this session because um, it, 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 I feel like it was a bold move to bring these people together who never spoke with each other on the one end and have different expertise. And, um, but also because they're all public scholars. We have here a bunch of amazing people that really look at how the world works or not and want to change the world the way this world works or not. So. Um, and we begin, and I, I'll present each of them and their work um, just before they speak. We are, uh, the reason we gathered here first is, uh, is really, we want kind of a Rebecca Tarlow, Professor Rebecca Tarlow from Penn State University to kind of bring us together through her book, um, a new book. And I, I want to um, first, uh, Rebecca, thank you for agreeing to be with us today and tell some, um, tell our um, guests um, who you are. So uh, Rebecca, first, I, I knew Rebecca from Occupy the Farm and from a course we taught together in Berkeley. So she's mostly less with the books and more, um, you know, outdoors protesting with the people she study and work with. Um, so tr truly a public scholar and uh, also um, a an assistant professor of education and labor employment relation at Penn State University. She's affiliated with the lifelong learning and adult education program um, and um, the comparative and international education program and the Center for Global Workers, right? She has a PhD in education from the University of California, Berkeley and was a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford University and her ethnographic research agenda has three broad areas of focus. And now you see what brings us here together, theories of state and state society relations, social movement, critical pedagogy and learning. 
and also Latin American education and development. So um, her book, and we asked her today to talk about her book, is called Occupying School, Occupying Land, How the Landless Workers Movement Transformed Brazilian Education. And it examines the education and initiative of the Brazilian landless workers movement, a national social movement of rural workers struggling for agrarian reform. It has been the winner of several important awards, such as the winner of the American Political Science Association, the Michael Harrington Book Award, the American Sociology Association and Sociology of Development Book Award, and the Comparative and International Education um, uh, Society, uh, Globalization and Education SIG Book Award. So, um, and also uh, the LASA Brazil section best book prize in the social sciences. And I think maybe I even missed a few prizes because it really uh, left an incredible, incredible impression. And um, really, um, I think we are not trying to compare here the landless people movement and unrecognized Bedouin villages. These are very different contexts for sure but we do have a bunch of people to kind of draw some inspiration from your book and, uh, and comment. Each of them will make some comments from their own um, angle and perspective from Palestine, from the Bedouin society, from critical education in an era of climate change and from food, uh, political ecology of food. Um, and, but this is our task. Now we just want to hear from you. Uh, Rebecca will open with a little bit of a longer um, talk about her work that draw these linkages between food sovereignty, food education, um, and more. Uh, and, uh, and then we are going to let each of our speaker um, give a perspective inspired by the book. <laughs> and I highly recommend reading the book. I, my students now read it every, and every time I teach political ecology. So, <laughs> so uh, Becky, to you, I'm going to mute myself and I, can, I ask people to, um, if you have questions, um, you can send them in the chat. And at the end of the session, we will also open the session for um, more questions that you can just uh, present yourself, okay? And thank you all for joining us. Wow, <laughs> that was quite the introduction. Uh, thanks, Mary. Um, can everyone hear me and see my PowerPoint? Thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, well, I mean, all I can say that it's like my, it's my honor to be here with all of you right now uh, at this conference um, on dry lands, deserts, and desertification. I have so few opportunities to engage cross-regionally, like the majority of conferences I go to are focused on the Latin American region. So just a real credit to Miri for thinking, conceptualizing this idea of having a panel on the intersections of education and food sovereignty um, from Brazil to Palestine. Um, it's, I mean, I just, it's such an honor to be here. And I hope, that, I hope the main focus is not my book, but rather what's important about this panel, which are the intersections between these two regions and social movements fighting for food sovereignty in their various ways and strategies in these two regions. So again, just such an honor to be here. I'm gonna try to keep the presentation um, to 20 minutes, 25 minutes, just so we have a lot of time to talk afterwards. Uh, but, but as Miri said, I'm going to be talking about um, my recently published book, you can see it right here, um, called Occupying Schools, Occupying Land, How the Landless Workers Movement Transformed Brazilian Education. I'm going to focus more on the food education, critical pedagogy aspect of the book today in today's talk, but I'll also give you a sense of the argument of the entire book. Um, but just to give you some context about how, and if the book has gotten any awards, it's because of the amazingness of the Brazilian landless workers movement more than anything else. I mean, again, just such an honor to be able to study this large social movement that has been inspiration to so many movements around the world, including Palestinian activists who have gone to Brazil and studied with the MST um, over the past five, six years. Um, so, so broadly, to give you a sense, the book is about the relationship to education and the state. Um, and it's important for me to always say that I didn't get interested in this topic between like the relationship between social movements and education as uh, a scholar or an academic, but rather I got interested in this topic as an activist. Um, so as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, I was embedded um, in the student movement, the anti-war movement, right? That was like we were in Iraq, um, also the anti-sweatshot movement. 
And I went, I went to Brazil for the first time as a junior in college, and I had the opportunity to volunteer with a feminist organization located in the northeast of the country. Um, and this feminist organization, they told me that their goal was to end all forms of sexism, racism, and class oppression. And you know, you know the 19 year old, 20 year old young woman, like I thought that was a really great goal that you were trying to end all forms of racism, sexism, class oppression. And so I remember asking the founder of the organization, how was it that she was gonna be able to achieve those goals? And she simply pointed to a picture of a person. Um, and maybe it's not a surprise to some of you, she pointed, she pointed to a picture of the Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, right? And so I, as an undergraduate, I had read Freire, I had read Pedagogy of the Press, but it hadn't really resonated with me. It seemed too theoretical. I wasn't sure what was at stake with the book. But then um, through this organization, I had the opportunity to watch as this, as this, as this group actually implemented Freire and educational pedagogies. And so I watched as, for example, elderly, elderly, elderly women would come together and they'd read the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And then they would discuss if they actually had these rights in their own communities. And so at a very young age, I became obsessed with this idea of pedagogy as education, as a pedagogy of social change. And when I returned to the United States, I really wondered why our social movements did not have the same expansive educational programs as the Brazilian social movements I had observed. <clears throat> and so I entered graduate school, not as a scholar, but as an activist, really interested in understanding this relationship between social movements and education. And so, <clears throat> just so, can you, did you all see the, ch the slide change? I uh, was just checked. You can see the next slide. Okay, awesome. So the driving research of my question became, how do agrarian movements work with, in, through, and outside of the state to promote their goals for food sovereignty? And what is the role of critical pedagogy in processes of social reproduction and resistance? And of course, um, my book answers this question through an ethnographic study of the Brazilian landless workers movement, or the MST, which is arguably the largest social movement in Latin America. And to understand the MST, I'll just give a little bit of background. You have to understand that Brazil itself is historically characterized by incredible disparities in land ownership, with a very small portion of the population, population owning the majority of the land and millions of rural workers who are landless, right? And furthermore, for a long time, especially in the more Afro-descendant Northeast part of the country, these large landowners were accustomed to only cultivating a very small portion of their land which resulted in the majority of arable land in Brazil lay in fallow. And so the MST arose in the early 1980s to contest this unequal land distribution. It did not start as one coherent movement, but rather dispersed attempts of landless rural laborers who decided to take the issue of poverty into their own hands um, and were often inspired by the theories of liberation theology and the Catholic Church to go out and occupy this land that was laying fallow and that was owned by a big landowner. Um, surprisingly, even during a period of dictatorship, because this was the early 1980s, uh, the land occupation tactic worked and the government began buying up this land and redistributing it to landless farmers. And so um, as more landless laborers began to both occupy and receive legal land rights in the early 1980s, Workers involved in these occupations formed a national movement in 1984. So that's important that the land occupations actually happened before the coherent social movement. Um, and they founded their movement with this phrase, the land belongs to those who work it. So uh, since the founding of the MST, the movement has grown to include 1.5 million people with 350,000 families that now have access to land. And the movement continues to organize land occupations to this day. In fact, this picture you're looking at is a picture of a land occupation that I participated in in 2011 um, when they were about to break through the gates and everyone shouted to me, Hebeka, Hebeka, jump over the gates and take a picture. And so I was actually able to jump over the gates and take this picture of uh, this incredible picture, right, of a land occupation in process. About a thousand people in um, the state of Pernambuco were gonna occupy a piece of unproductive land. 
So currently the MST articulates its struggles in terms of three broad goals, land reform, agrarian reform, and social transformation. So although land reform is a central component of agrarian reform, so getting land is part of agrarian reform, the movement separates out these goals in order to highlight that the initial struggle for, for getting land through land occupations is actually only a first step in achieving agrarian reform, which is the resources necessary for families to live sustainably in this land, right? So roads, housing, technical assistance, et cetera. Um, social transformation is the MST's struggle. It's the MST's most polemical, right? Because it's the struggle for socialist economic practices. The movement is a self-declared socialist movement. Um, and it's also fighting for what it refers to as popular grassroots democracy. Again, this is one of the most radical goals of the movement as activists openly denounce capitalism and celebrate historical attempts to construct socialism. Uh, the movement's uh, vision of social transformation has also evolved over the past decades to encompass women's rights, the defense of indigenous land, racial equality, and more recently over the past five years, the celebration of LGBT working class rights. And of course, really important for our panel today is that the most central component of the struggle for social transformation for the MST is the fight for food sovereignty, which is defined as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own agricultural systems. Food sovereignty is what we could call the utopian vision of the world that the MST is trying to build, right? This is the goal is to have food sovereignty for all of its communities. Okay, so the question for all of you is like, what, is, what does this have to do with education? You know, my whole book is about education. What does this struggle have to do about education itself? And so importantly, initially the MST wasn't really sure how education fit into their struggle. Um, the movement obviously invested in non-formal political education programs, but was actually initially less concerned with formal school systems. However, what began to happen in the early 1980s is that the MST would occupy land, the government would redistribute that land, then the government, like a good, good local government, would build a school in those new communities and send teachers to those schools who then would teach the sons and daughters of the people who occupied that their parents were illegal outlaws, the movement was worthless, and then the best thing they could do for their future was to go to an urban area and get a good urban job because farming was a backwards profession. And so the MST soon realized that like, in order to achieve its goals of food sovereignty and societal transformation, it not only had to occupy land itself, but it had to actually occupy the public school system. Because if not, the public school system would raise a generation of youth who would go against the goals of the movement. And so, and, and that's complicated, right? Because the school system we know is like a capitalist school system run by the state. And so I would often ask activists, like how do you understand like your struggle in the public school system? And one activist explained to me, to explain it to me in this way, right? She said to me, education is always connected to the maintenance of the economic model. In this sense, schools in our society are capitalist schools because the system needs this ideological tool to support itself. Whatever struggle against this economic model, whatever type of counter hegemonic work is also going to need education and it has to be constructed within this hegemonic space. To dispute hegemony, you have to fight within it for other principles. So obviously the movement's very sophisticated. This is a very sophisticated uh, analysis drawing on Antonio Gramsci and the ideas of hegemony and counter hegemony and how you have to fight for fight, fight your resistance struggles on the terrain of the current hegemonic institutions, right? And so with this philosophy over the past 30 years, the MSC has actually been able to win access to 2000 schools within its agrarian reform settlements. That means they have 8,000 teachers that are currently attending 250,000 students. Very importantly, state and, municipal, state and municipal governments administer almost all of these schools. And many of these governments actually allow the MST to participate in educational co-governance, where they implement radically different organizational and curricular practices that encourage students to stay in the countryside and become farmer intellectuals 
while also fostering activism, direct democracy, and collective forms of work. So it's pretty impressive. In addition, the MST leadership has helped develop programs for adult literacy, um, primary and secondary school, high schools, bachelor's and graduate degrees, in partnership with 80 different higher education institutions, public universities, involving hundreds of thousands of students. All of these programs that you're looking at here on this PowerPoint, um, they could be called affirmative action programs for land occupation participants because the programs only accept students whose families are occupying land or who have won land through a land occupation, right? And so these formal educational programs have literally transformed the MST um, from a movement of farmers with at most elementary or middle school education to a movement of farmers who are college graduates in a diversity of disciplines and professions. So again, <laughs> these are some really huge accomplishments. And importantly, these accomplishments go against many of the predictions in our academic literature, right? So some of you may know in the sociology literature on social movements, scholars often argue that social movements inevitably become more conservative and less effective as they institutionalize. This perspective goes back to Michelle's, Robert Michelle's argument of the iron rule of oligarchy or the tendency for organizations to become more oligarchical and bureaucratic over time. And also more recently, Piven and Cloward's claim that disruptive protest is the most effective social movement strategy, right? And so activists and scholars who embrace this perspective often celebrate, um, for example, the Mexican Zapatistas movement strategy of building counter institutions outside of the realm of the state. Or they uh, celebrate the US occupied movement's focus on creating an alternative social world within the boundaries of Zuccotti Park, with that, where that occupation was uh, taking place. Uh, these scholars and activists also critique social movements that decide to enter and engage the political sphere, like the Chilean student movement's foray into electoral politics, or the MST itself is often highly critiqued with their very close relationship with the Brazilian Workers' Party. However, and this is sort of the, the big argument in my book, is that these fears about engaging the state do not explain this picture. Okay, so in this picture, what you're looking at is a legally recognized public school standing within an illegal MST land occupation. N not only have MST activists gotten the government to recognize the public school, the movement has also gotten permission for the school to move with the movement of the movement. So in this picture, the MSC occupied encampment is marching to the Capitol in order to demand more resources for their camps. And the school is legally allowed to march with the movement. Thus here, the state actually becomes part of the mobilization of the social movement. The public school here both continues to be a state institution and is now part of the movement's contestation against that same state. So for, for me, this seems more like the MST co-opting the state rather than the state co-opting the movement. Um, and so on that note, I wanna just return to my book briefly um, and say that the, the first major contribution I'm trying to make to the theorization of social movements is moving away on the one hand from an idealization of disruptive protest as the only effective form of activism, or on the other hand, from an uncritical embracing of institutional inroads or state negotiation. Instead, I try to um, promote this theory of what I'm calling contentious co-governance, which is when social movements overseeing and managing public, when social movements engage in the provision of public services with state actors, while simultaneously organizing contentious political actions and promoting practices that come into conflict with institutional norms and the interests of the state itself. So in other words, protest is not enough, but neither is negotiation. You have to have both of them over and over and over again, right? Um, a second argument I make in my book is that contentious co-governance of state institution not only is good for getting demands met, but actually can contribute to the internal capacity and long-term relevance of social movements. And third, that social movements can actually participate in contentious co-governance of state institutions in diverse political contexts not just left-wing regimes, but also under right-wing and conservative governments. So I have various case studies in my book where I show how the movement is able to push forward its educational project under extremely unlikely circumstances. Um, so
so I, um, so, so I base all of these sort of arguments on a total of 20 months of ethnographic research in Brazil, where I lived with MSC educational activists and participated in movement activities. Um, this was a multi-sided political ethnography, so I studied five school systems and also looked at trajectories at the national level. And today, clearly, I don't have time to dive deeply into my book, um, but I do want to offer a few reflections on why the pedagogy of the MSC is critical for the movement's fight for food sovereignty and how social movement pedagogy can transform into what I call critical food systems education, right? So how we can actually use education as a mean to, means to achieve food sovereignty. Okay, so just a little more, I think about five, 10 more minutes, is that cool? Okay. So um, as I already discussed, the MSC began developing alternative educational pedagogies for their schools um, very early on. And consequently, by the mid-1990s, the national MSC education sector had already developed dozens of educational initiatives with state and municipal governance, governments across the country, including massive literacy campaigns, child care programs, and, and probably most impressively, the movement's own high school, which provided professional degrees in both teaching and agricultural cooperative administration. And so if you were an activist who joined the movement in the early 1990s and you did not have a high school degree, you were quickly sent off to the southern state of Rio Grande do Sul, where the school was located, to experience the movement's alternative educational approach, also get a high school degree, also get a degree in either teaching or agriculture, agricultural cooperative administration. And so due to this success, the MSC began to develop more high school programs across the country many of which then allowed young people to get a high school degree and also a technical certificate in agroecological farming. Here's a picture of one of those high schools. And so these schools became what the late Eric Olin Wright refers to as real utopias. They allowed an activist to envision the counters an alternative social world that embodies emancipatory ideals so that activists can implement those ideals of food sovereignty in their own communities. So in other words, at these schools, they are able to implement agroecological farming methods that just wouldn't be possible in their own communities, but they were able to live that utopian vision of what food sovereignty looked like. And then when they got back to their own communities, implement where they could these alternative farming projects. So activists drew on a diversity of critical pedagogies in these schools. Of course, uh, as you could guess, one of the major inspirations was Paulo Freire. Um, Paulo Freire was introduced to the MSC through the liberation theology movement in the Catholic Church in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And from Freire, the movement really took ideas such as dialogical education, generative theme, and drawing on local knowledge. However, the, the movement also sought out other critical pedagogies that could support their agrarian vision for food sovereignty. As one educator told me, she said in the early, in the mid 1980s, we were looking for a new educational proposal and we thought, where in the world have they attempted to create a school system for a socialist system? And to everyone's surprise, one of the answers to that question was actually the Soviet Union. And more specifically, the innovative pedagogies that developed during the first 15 years of the Soviet Union before Stalin consolidated his power. So one of these um, <clears throat> Soviet educators was Moisey Pestraki, who theorized work as an educational process. The idea here is that capitalism has historically separated those who are gonna be intellectual laborers and those who are gonna be manual laborers. But as farmers and peasants, it was important to unify manual and intellectual labor and, to, and turn all MSC activists into farmer intellectuals. Another, another Soviet theorist the MSC drew on was Anton Makarenko. You can see they're actually recreating his face in the classroom floor with beans and rice here. Um, Makarenko theorized the role of the collectives in schools, um, and he thought that students could run their own schools through a system of self-governance. This appealed to the MSC, who was trying to create a society that was based on direct democracy through collective decision making. So based on these socialist ideals, as well as the movement's organic practices, the movement developed even more high school programs for teachers and adult students based on the ideas of collaboration and solidarity, collective work, self-governance, food sovereignty education, and the relationship between theory and practice. 
So one activist described these programs as laboratories, working with people who are in the classroom and trying to see if this or that worked. So there are huge experiments. Interestingly, the movement also moved into the university sphere with university programs in agronomy and the pedagogy of land, among other disciplines. And a key focus of these university programs was a connection between theory and practice, asking every student to complete research projects where they first basically investigate their local reality and then they try to figure out a way to intervene and change that reality, whether that's through a local food sovereignty project or um, through creating a kid's ban with recycled materials, etc. And so this connection between theory and practice through research was really central. Um, these courses uh, also went beyond the disciplines of education and agronomy. In fact, this is a picture of the MSC's first graduating class in law. Um, so for the movement, the fight for food sovereignty doesn't require just agronomists, right? You need a diversity of professions. So as one activist told me, because of these programs, she said, now we have pedagogues, agronomists, lawyers, journalists, all of the professions in the countryside that are important for the working class. So finally, um, the embassy is often asked, what exactly is the pedagogy that they follow? And the movement's response is always the same. They do not follow a pedagogy. They actually develop the pedagogy, a pedagogy that allows them to push forward their political, social, and agroecological goals. And the movement has published dozens of books and pamphlets that outline the philosophical and pedagogical principles of the movement, which again are now an inspiration to other social, other social movements globally. So, so what are the conclusions we can draw from the MSC's experience thinking more broadly about food sovereignty, critical food education? Um, and, and there's so many conclusions, but I wanna leave you with three main conclusions that I think are the big ideas I also highlight in my book. The first one is contrary to the conventional belief that social movements cannot engage the state without becoming co-opted and demobilized, this study shows how movements can advance their struggles by strategically working with, in, through, and outside of state institutions to push forward food sovereignty. The movement has been able to institutionalize their pedagogical initiatives within different local and state governments and federal and state agencies. Although these gains are always ten tenuous, especially now with the right-wing fascist president, because the MSC is working in so many different state spheres, when some opportunities close, others will always open. A second important conclusion is that the contentious co-governance of public education can help movement act, how, can help the movement recruit new activists and diversify their membership and increase their practical and technical knowledge about agriculture, ecological farming and related professions. So although the movement could work separately from the state and only with their own activists by occupying the state sphere, They've been able to expand their influence, to, uh, the influence of their movement to populations that might never have gotten the opportunity to engage with MSC activists. This process is never easy and never without conflict, but it has been critical, critical, critical to the long-term sustainability of the movement. Um, and third and finally, and this is like one of the key sort of interventions I'm trying to make, is that participating in the MSC's educational initiatives offers children, young people, and adults an opportunity to prefigure in the current world practices such as participatory democracy, collective work, and agricultural ecological farming that they hope to promote in the future. So in other words, I don't disagree with people who think that prefiguring the world we want to build is critical. But the point here is that it does not have to happen only outside of the purview of the state or after the revolution. We could and should build the world we want to see in all of the institutional and non-institutional spaces that are central part of the lives of our, of our communities. And that might be the only way we can truly build food sovereignty. So thank you. That's the presentation. And I look forward to dialogue with the other panelists. Thank you very much. Um... I will move forward to the only one in this panel who has uh, more expertise in food politics than in education, um, Dr. Rafi uh, Grossley. Um, of course, we can see that the context is very different and we have a long way to go, definitely in Bedouin communities in the Negev uh, before we reach uh, um, the achievements of uh, the landless people, um, the landless workers movement. 
Um, but still, um, so when we, when we um, talk to Rafi, then the question is really about, the question I, I threw at him was really about food as this uh, domain of change, as the realm of change and power. Uh, and Rafi Grosnik is a researcher, he just, he was just till a couple of months ago, a research affiliate at the University of California, Davis, and he's now a lecturer at the Ben-Gurion University. He, his area of interest is sociology and anthropology of food and agriculture, globalization, consumption, popular culture, environmental sociology, and Israel society. Uh, his most rec recent research project deals with uh, personalized nutrition, technology, and human microbes nexus, and consumer culture, um, and he's co-editor of a special issue on food and power in the Middle East in food, culture, and society, and a special issue on environment and society in Israel and Israeli sociology. He's also the author of Organic Food in Israel, Resistance, Assimilation, and Global Culture, and Globalizing Organic, that is a forthcoming, right, Rafi? So thank you for joining us. You have um, less time than Becky, only um, 10 minutes. Um, just. I'll share you with my thoughts. Um, yes, thank you, Miri, so much. I'm, I'm so delighted to be here and thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure. And I, I still cannot think because I'm really shocked about the amazing project of, of uh, Becky. And I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm taking the time of talking to much more interesting stuff right now. Uh, so, <laughs> because it was really such a fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, I, uh, what, what I will try to, to, to talk about today would be something that goes, that I would try to serve nearly your question and try to engage more with the question of what is critical food ped pedagogy and, and less about describing my own research project, even though that I cannot separate between the two. And there is a very clear kind of coherent between what I think about uh, uh, teaching and education and what I found in my own research project. Uh, do you hear me well, by the way? Can you see me, hear me? Is everything okay? Okay, great. Um, so I, I will refer to the last, um, I mean, you presented nicely all of my achievements and things that I do, but I will refer mostly to, the, to my last project uh, which, or my last publication, which is a forthcoming book about globalizing organic. And, and that, that project is based on my dissertation project. I am a sociologist and an anthropologist. I graduated from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology of Ben Gurion University of the Negev. And my perspective on food is really, is first and foremost from a foodie from someone that is interested in food. Uh, it's a topic of another lecture. I studied cooking in China in 1999. So I was really one of those foodies that you can imagine fascinated by food. And I started to work more about how food and culture and society are interacting in Israeli society. And it led me into exploring the way that people understand how food or, or experience, the industrialization of food, the globalization of food in Israel, that was my first project. Then I moved to organic project because I really wanted to, sh to, to, to look at what, what might be a kind of a resistance to the, what we call industrialization of food, McDonaldization of food, uh, conventionalization of food, all of these conventional food system uh, uh, labels. So I picked organic food as a kind of an example to, to understand what are the pushbacks or what is the alternative, what is the resistance to some of the uh, conventionalization of food. And what I found in my research, and again, I was focused much more on the Jewish community in Israel, uh, ultimately, or, or kind of like, uh, it goes without saying that when I'm exploring organic food, I'm much more directed into upper classes, most of them Jewish uh, communities. So these, these were the people that used to deal with organic food, to consume organic food, to produce organic food, to distribute market, and so on and so, so forth. 
Um, and, 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 and what I found, and this is basically the argument in, in, in my book, is that dealing with alternative food initiatives, dealing with what we call alter, alternative food labels, is much more of a uh, globalizing project and less of a critical resistance and, and uh, pushing back the uh, conventional food system. So I, I, I will not go into my own research, but I try to demonstrate it, and, and this is something that I do in my book, how if you look at organic food movement in Israel and organic agriculture, if you look at all of the aspect of organic food in the production, distribution, and consumption, you can see that all of the components of these systems work in, in kind of a, there, there is one common denominator uh, uh, that, that all of them share, and this is the, the point of being part of the globe, being part of the global system, getting connected into the global system in, in general. So in Israel, the, the organic food production is really moved into working with the conventional ag agriculture and less resisting and try to propose alternatives to this, more in the cultural and the sociological perspective. Of course, that the methods are completely different, but, but, but that, that was one of the, of the issues. And, and again, it goes also to consumption and, and distribution. And so, so this is the background, this is the research background then that I arrived to, to my classes. And as Miri um, described, I've, I've been teaching in several institutions, both in Israel and in the US. And most of the, of the students that I, that I had encountered with or engaged with were actually people that are not food activists uh, for, from, from, from the start. These were more, most of the people that are interested in, in sociology in gender in, in general in politics in gender and less about food and one of my challenges is first to show them how food is important how food is critical how food can say something and teach them about their identity and how how food might 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 change all kinds of sociological issues and and, and processes and what I found is that most of them, when they think about uh, um, alternatives to conventional uh, food system or to think of remedies to the problems of, of the food system, they ultimately speak immediately, kind of like bringing all of the labels that, that, that we all know and that we all encounter in supermarkets, which are local food or organic food and fair trade. And all of these labels and, 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 and systems and, and uh, basically kind of like labels that, that, they, that they all know. And one thing that I could see mostly in the United States, but also in, in Israel, in the place that, that, I, that I used to, to work with, is that the way that students think about alternative, what is alternative, is ultimately thinking about the more institutionalized and organized label that they can encounter. But the problem is that most of these encounters are, are happening in, in the supermarkets when they go into the conventional systems themselves. And of course, it raises a whole set of problems. When I, when I listen to, to Becky, to, to this uh, MST uh, initiatives, it seems to me so far from many of the students that I used to, to teach and, and, and I was engaged with, because one of the basic things that were missing in the way that they think is that food is first and foremost a project of your own self. And then the, this notion of working on the self uh, uh, in sociology, we call it technologies of the self. So the way that they interpret organic food is a kind of a technology of the self. It's, it's an, a substance that I can consume in my body. It is healthy. It is good for me. And especially I, I, I could see it in Israel when, when I asked students, what is your interpretation to organic food? It, it almost kind of like intuitively went through the health issues. 
when I talk to them, you know, all organic food or fair trade or other labels have, have all kinds of other goals and purposes and some philosophical foundations that they are based on, they couldn't really get, get to know. Some of them, of course, know and, and, and are, are connected and, and can, can think of the sustainability and meanings of, uh, of alternative food labels, such as organic food. But what, what takes the lion's share and what takes the most important part, the way that they think about it, is some kind of substance that might work for the self. And therefore, what seems to them is the most critical and important in terms of like practical things to do or thinking about is to talk to the individual consumer. So one of the things that I could see is that the high uh, uh, emphasis that they put on the consumption part, their own consumption and the education of other people's consumption. Um, geographer Julie Gottman, she, she is teaching in the uh, um, University of California, Santa Cruz, and she published several books, uh, several articles with the title of If They Only Knew, which basically uh, put the argument that most or a lot of the food activism, alternative food movements that was initiated by upper classes, upper middle classes, is pretty much occupied with educating low opportunities, low income communities about the problems of uh, uh, the conventional food system. And that of course has a very much limited impact and very much limited understanding and, and, and very much limited a, a, a way to, to change the system. Very much different than the uh, MST initiatives that Becky just uh, presented. So, uh, um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm just completing. And, and, and the way that I uh, interpret the focusing on the self and the focusing on the consumption is, uh, is, is basically about this neoliberal culture that directs the way that people understand right now what food is, what is the role of food, who has the responsibility of changing something, the, 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 the understanding of the power of the consumer is very much important. And the last point that I want to, to, to add to this neoliberalization, globalizing project of alternative uh, food system, which pedagogy is part of it and critical pedagogy is, is part of it because who are the people that goes to these schools? Who are the people that go to all of these NGOs that try to promote Basically, they are, they, they are people from the upper classes. So the other thing is that dealing and encountering with alternative food movements turn out to be a project of identity, and it makes what we call in sociology social distinction. So not all of this is a social distinction because people try to distinct themselves from, like, like you know, from a, a very clear conscience power relations, but even some kind of unintended consequences. The problem is that some people are grouping together and most of the time there are people that share the same culture and share the same uh, language. So for instance, in the organic movement as a whole, what I could very easily see is that the representation of Palestinian farmers, uh, of people that are not belong to the upper classes, even though they practice a lot of the a organic practices and movement, they do not have a, 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 a way into this movement, not because they are forbidden to take part, but because culturally and socially, they don't speak the same language and they have a lot of limitations to get uh, uh, into that. And, and it goes also to lower uh, a class in terms of like education, not, not only Palestinian and Jews, but also in between uh, um, uh, groups inside the, the, the Jewish community in Israel. And so I think that these are the two cultural and political aspects that I could, could see as part of this neoliberalization of food movement, but also the neoliberalization of critical food pedagogy, which I think that we need to, to take into our consideration.
Rafi, thank, thank you, you so, so much. You definitely add many layers. By the way, Rafi has an upcoming paper about uh, organic food production in the settlement in the occupied territories, right. which really complicates the story because we, now we have food production, organic food production in the Bedouin sector, and we have uh, organic food production um, that is pretty broad um, in the settlements. And I think that will pose a new set of questions to all of us and our personal politics also. Um, I want to create a slight change in, in the order of speakers if the speakers agree with me. I think it would be really nice now to actually hear you, Lana, if you don't mind. Uh, also, first, because we have um, men and women here, and so it's a nice order, but second also because Rafi kind of touched on so many things that is relevant to you. Lana, um, is that okay with you? Are you, uh, or do you prefer that we stick to the original order? Lana, are you with us? kind of lost her. She just disappeared. Okay. Okay, David, so we, we, will, we will continue with you maybe, and I'll check what's going on with Lana's connection. Okay. Um, okay, so David um, Dunitz, thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, so David uh, is another, um, you know, example of a scholar and an activist, and I don't know which one comes first not in, in terms of order and not in terms of action. Uh, David Dunitz is a faculty member at the Kibbutzim College. He's the head of the Heschel Center Education. No Department. longer, no longer. No? No? no. That's very new, okay. Which one is no longer? Okay. Kibbutzim <laughs> College. Ah, okay. And uh, so he was a faculty member at the Kibbutzim College and the head of the Heschel Center Education Division since 2010 and CEO between the years 2014 and two. Uh, 2016, he is one of the founders of the Green Network, a leading educational organization promoting education for sustainability in Israel in cooperation with the Ministry of the Environment, the Ministry of Education, and the Heschel Center. Uh, he holds a PhD in education from Haifa University, focusing on environmental education and education for sustainability and critical theory. He has published several articles on education for sustainability as transformation and education and has been teaching, advising, and conducting practical research for several years now on local education practices, local sustainable education, and community educational change in the age of globalization. Um, so, David, you, uh, so David is clearly um, uh, one of those people here that represent the educational world, almost educational philosophy. And uh, I let um, David speak. I, I just want to say that David dealt a lot with um, the, the, the possibility and the limits and the challenges of including Palestinians in, in, um, in educational reforms, right, in Israel also. So, um, David, to you. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for having me. This is great. <laughs> and I really, Becky, um, your talk is so inspiring. It kind of ticked off all the time, kind of, oh, yes, oh, yes, now I understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, that's what great theory does, actually. And thanks for that a lot. Um, I'm a very, you know, my, my, I'm not going to talk very much about food sovereignty because I know very little about um, the, the critical food systems um, pedagogy you're talking about, but it's very intriguing to me. Um, but I love to eat and I love to cook. And I think it's a great way in. I will talk a, a bit about the things that I'm, I've been dealing with climate education, climate justice education, and how that links in, I think, to some of the things that you're talking about um, here in this session. Uh, I really liked the point, the big point you made about uh, challenging um, um, contemporary critiques that it's either um, protest or co-optation in social movements. And since I've been involved in social movements, social change movements, and in education, I really think that the linkages that you've made, Becky, are, are, are critical, are great, actually. We should actually think more about them. So I'm going to try to use my presentation to talk to that a bit, about how we're, how we're linking um, climate education and social movements. So I've got a little presentation here, which I'll not show all of it, but we'll try to talk to this. Um, do, you, do you see that? Can everyone see that presentation okay? Hello? Yes. Yes. It's okay? Fine. Um, 
And where'd it go? We see it, David. You see it and I lost it. I lose it, okay? No, that's not the one. Okay. Um, let's hope. Um, Can you please uh, press the presentation slideshow? Ah, uh, uh, okay, that might finding? be better. All right, all right, thank you. Great. Now, um, I've been involved with the evolution of environmental education in Israel, which this is, this is way before my time, but some people could, will recognize that environmental education sources was in a, a romantic and kind of semi-militaristic um, um, so, um, view of conquering the land on foot. And it, this was the metaphor that was used um, before statehood even, where, where coming back to the land was, was viewed as um, um, almost a secular religious um, conquest of the land. And that, that evolved into what later became environmental education, nature studies, um, environmental science, and, and into sustainability education in the 1990s and 2000s. And, and very much, I think today, we're talking much more. I mean, the, the monikers and the names change and shift according to trends. Um, I think climate education is, is, is very much a, the, the, the thing, the flavor of the, of the month or the years of, of, the, of the recent times. Um, so I've been, 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 been trying to uh, grapple with how climate change pedagogy can be a conduit for change. Um, and we put together a course for teacher training. It wasn't a, a very short time ago in the Israeli school system. It wasn't even, wasn't even the mention of climate change was very sporadic. It wasn't studied in any way or form. And this is probably true for most educational systems. And we put together a course that was sort of under the radar for teachers um, who heard about it and came for the training. And they trained students to, to, to teach to other students. And this, this, this actually became very, very popular. And one of the things that we, we, we grappled with is how do, we, how do we teach climate change in an era where, um, where, where we, in this era where, would, where wouldn't uh, um, despair and shut down children and young people, but actually empower them back for change. And one of the things that we, we realized was linking it up to social change movements and to being part of social activism and climate activism was one way of, of, of creating that, that, that very necessary linkage between theory and practice. Um, and the Israeli climate movement has come of age in, in, in recent years. And here's a picture of the, the climate march, which had more than 7,000 people. And our annual conferences now draw more than 1,500 people. And there are over 80 organizations today in the climate um, coalition of, of um, organizations. So, there is a kind of intersection or a very clear linkage between climate education and the social movement for uh, dealing with climate change in Israel. And they feed off of each other. I'll just give you one example, which, which we're very proud of at the Heschel Center. As a result of, um, of working with government, and we at the Heschel Center do engage government officials very much in, in kind of like, I like the way you framed it, Rebecca. Um, that we, we, we sometimes are contentious and sometimes we engage with people in the government who can um, very often at middle level, they can actually come around and see things the way we would like to see things. But this was a, um, a kind of um, a climate, uh, an energy group that was set up at the Heschel Center to work, work on 100% renewables for Israel to create the, 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 the infrastructure, the thinking and the theory and the practice of how it could be done. And in the end, uh, they set up a, a, a proposal for government, how it could actually be done. And people in Israel know that a very short time ago, we were at 2% renewables, we're still not very high. And, and, um, and, and today that's changing within government. We can see even within the energy ministry, which is still um, uh, kind, of, kind of linked to gas, they're beginning to come around and to see that we can reach um, a, a goal. We put out the goal of 100% renewals by 2050, 50% by 2030. And that's actually in the discussion right now. 
And uh, so we, we see that social movements and, and working with government often for, on policy change can help and can, and can work. Um, we see, in, 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 as I said, in the, in the uh, environment, in the education ministry, there was absolutely al almost no climate education. This is something that's come out right now, right in recent months. The ministry set a, a, has a unit on introduction to climate change. And I'll tell you, it's not bad. I think it was very influenced by a lot of the stuff that, we, that we've done, we've put out. Uh, it still reaches a very small minority of teachers and, and students, but looking into it, there are some critical components to it because a lot of environmental sustainability education and even food education within the system, school gardens and, and community gardens are very often at the level, um, I think what Rafi talked about of self-improvement, nutrition, health-based, very often do not challenge the, the, the systemic um, and, the, and the social issues that are behind, those social economic issues um, and mechanism and drivers that are behind um, the climate crisis and, and the food crisis. Um, so as we know, we're now in the COVID and we're now heavily in the economic and the COVID recession, but climate is on, on the way. It's already here and, and it has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with at all levels and, it, and education is, in my view, is one of the necessary components for social change. Because as COVID has revealed to us, um, um, our systems, um, sorry for the, you know, the blunt language, our, system, we're, you know, our systems are fucked, <laughs> as they say. We're, we're really, really, uh, we can see their fragility, we can see how inequality is, is rising, will, will rise as these systems do not function well. Our food systems, our financial systems, health systems, education. Um, we have a, a, a million young people who haven't gone to school for, for nearly a year or, or anything that looks like school. Um, our care for the elderly was severely challenged. And our democracies are, are in trouble. So in many ways, we're getting a kind of uh, 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 how do you call it, prefigurative, a prefigurative view of a dystopia of what may happen um, under climate change in much, much uh, worse conditions. Um, so climate change can only be beat, climate change is a collective action problem. Okay, so we need the science, we need democracy, and we're in trouble because we have, we need a very high level of trust and collectivity to be able to, in our political institutions, and in science, and that's precisely what we don't have right now. Um, I'll skip the slides just to show that it, very often environmental and, 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 and sustainability talks about private or privatizes what we have to do to, to address um, climate change. And climate change is a systemic problem, cannot be addressed without systemic solutions. Um, and climate change is, is a, a a window into inequality. We can see that the, the, the people most responsible for, for climate change um, will, will pay less for it, and the poorest and the most vulnerable who are least responsible for climate change are going to pay, everyone will pay a price, but the, the price will be much farther, much higher on fragile and, 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 and communities um, at, the, um, at the forefront. Um, David, we need to conclude okay. here. So there's, so, so there is a, one of my favorite rabbis. Where what's happening, and where where is the light coming in? What are the what are the pedagogies of possibility? What are the politics and and the pedagogies of possibilities? And and I can I think today we have we can see through the lens of COVID and climate on the way that there are places for um, not just not just um, reproduction but resistance and transformation. First of all, I'll run through it, and, and I think I'll end with that, because my time is up, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're, seeing, we're seeing opportunities for de-schooling society, what Ivan Illich talked about in the 70s, because there is no school anymore, really, and schools have de definitely gone defunct. And we're seeing a way of um, a pedagogy of contestation. We're seeing the, the, um, the, the protest movement, which I'm very involved with here in Israel, is actually a, a, a school for for political education for young people. Um, 
Uh, we're seeing a need for democracy and opportunities for, for new forms of democracy to be innovated and re reimagined. Uh, the need for solidarity with nature, intergener intergenerational justice. Young people today are more, more at the forefront of the protest movement, um, and they will have to be in climate education. Um, and we're going to have to create pedagogies for living with uncertainty and complexity. So to, to end with this slide here, we're talking about the pedagogies of possibilities. In, in, in the weekend Haaretz, there was a talk of how young people are taking part in the protest movement, in the Balfour and the protest movement against the government. Um, I think it is, it is a, a, an arena of, of pedagogy where young people are learning both on law, in real time, democracy and what protest is about, um, instead of going to school, which is, which is, uh, which is our new spaces for transformation. Um, and we're seeing that more and more in the, um, in the XR movement. We're also seeing new, new forms of democracy coming out, um, of deliberative and participatory democratic forms coming out of, say, this is in France, the, the, uh, the um, climate assembly in France, in Britain, in Spain, um, and hopefully this year in Israel is one of, one of the projects I'm working on right now. Um, so, Thank you very much. For now, I think that's enough. And thank you for, thank you for thank your- Thank you, David. Um, we are going back now to more grassroots um, kind of thinking. And I think the potentials and the possibilities that the hegemonic environmental movement in Israel, if I may say so, can benefit from um, a, a, a agro-resistance and resistant movement. Uh, we have uh, with us um, Lana Kaskia, and if uh, uh, Rafi comes from food and David from education, then Lana is the perfect, perfect articul articulation. Lana, forgive me that I'm objectifying you a little bit um, of, um, of both um, uh, food educator activist, I may say so. Um, and I asked Lana to, um, to uh, talk to us a little bit about, I, I can't imagine a discussion like this going on about food and land without thinking about Palestinians um, in, this, um, in the territories and inside Israel. Um, it just makes no sense. And it, it's, so, it's such a, a lacking perspective in, in so many conferences, um, particularly about environmental education. So um, I asked Lana to um, talk to us a little bit about the political context of education. I just want to say that Lana is, Lana was born in Tulkarem and she's a graduate of the University of Haifa with BA in philosophy and political science. She holds a teaching diploma and works as a consultant and educator and a farmer in organic agriculture. She's a founder of Jiwar Fitabia, an educational project combining learning and working the land and philosophy in the open space. So, um, Lana, so many questions about what all of that means at all for Palestinians in Israel. Is there any food education in the Palestinian sector? What does it mean? And whatever you want to teach us a little bit about. Just unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, first, I'd like to start that I'm really glad to participate in such meeting where uh, we're taking the MS, MST, MST model to, to learn about it and uh, to learn also how to benefit uh, from uh, the, their experience. I happen to know about the MST uh, some uh, years ago when uh, some of the activists of MST joined a conference in Haifa uh, for the right of for the right of return of the Palestinian refugees and the one and the, the one alternative of a one uh, democratic uh, secular state in historical Palestine. Uh, and I, just a moment uh, and David can you kindly please stop sharing? Thank you. Uh, and uh, but still uh, there is so much uh, info that I got from uh, information that I got from uh, Rebecca's uh, review in her, in her book and uh, and I thank you. Uh, 
Uh, well, as for the Palestinian perspective or what is happening here, uh, if we look at the, the food production from a, a critical perspective in the context and in the reality of Palestinians, it becomes clear how food and it, uh, how uh, food uh, is deeply rooted in the, in the Palestinian heritage, history and identity. Uh, as well as to th uh, the condition um, uh, as a people who are deprived from the right uh, to freedom and sovereignty. Food has always functioned as a trigger for different civilians' uh, acts of uh, resistance against Israel's uh, settler colonial policies, such as what happened uh, in Landa in 1976, uh, and the continuous civilian resistance against uh, the apartheid wall uh, of separation and the ongoing demolition of uh, the Bedouin villages in uh, Naqab. I'm going to address the question of uh, food production and, uh, education, and education, referring with respect to one of the fragments that uh, constitutes the Palestinian collective, that is, uh, those who are known as the Palestinians of uh, 1948. The, these Palestinians of uh, 1948 are the ones who managed to remain in their territories in the region of the Galilee and the Triangle and the Naqab. And here I want to emphasize that I was born in Tira, uh, not in Tulkarim. Tulkarim is in the West Bank uh, and uh, Tira is uh, 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 in what's so-called now Israel, in, and it's in the triangle close to Tulkarim, but now it's separated by the uh, apartheid wall. Uh, the Palestinians of uh, 48, they have sur survived the ethnic cleansing in uh, Palestine during the Nakba, which had brought the demolition of uh, more than 500 Palestinian villages and later became, of course, citizens of the state of Israel. I'd like to give uh, the political and the historical context to the land and food policies in Palestine. In Palestine. Uh, and the reality of the Palestinians nowadays uh, in the West Bank, actually, if we want to examine it, is actually a reproduction of the tragic colonial agricultural reality in Palestine before and during the establishment of Israel as a Jewish uh, homeland. Now, the colonial alliance between the Britain and the, the Zionist movement during the, the years of the British mandate systemically destroyed the traditional Palestinian agricultural economy. Uh, the alliance uh, did, uh, did so through uh, guaranteeing the disposition of agricultural lands that belonged to Palestinians, to the Zionist settlers and into institution giving the, them the control over important economic branches, mainly the citrus. Um, today, we still witness how Israeli institutions and industry and settler and political movements are still maintaining and reproducing the same historical relation with the, Palestin uh, with the Palestinians and their lands in all of Palestine. It is the, a relation that is characterized by a constant uh, violence a relation where agriculture is actually instrumented as a tool of brutal violence, constitu uh, constituting an evidence to what Francis Bacon once said, that colonialism is a massive operating uh, of planting and displanting. Uh, we can witness the Israeli violence, or sorry, the Israeli violence didn't only uh, lead to the impoverished impoverishment of uh, Palestinian farmers, uh, but also transform them into cheap and non-professional uh, labor for the Israeli economy, especially the, the private sector. sector. There have been uh, many implica uh, implications of such um, a violence uh, on the level of identity of the Palestinians, even of their uh, physical existence. Israel has used farm animals, such as cows, uh, as well as plants, in order to reshape the landscape and erase Palestinian, uh, 
present and historical presence in their land. Israel employed cows, for example, uh, to destroy the remaining construction of uh, any sign of life in the areas of the villages that were uh, demolished during the Nakba, uh, giving the observer the impression as if uh, he's standing in front of uh, gr grasslands, uh, like in Ikrit, for example, or in uh, Biraim. And then uh, not of, or miski, and the uh, examples are endless, and not of homes and the uh, fields that once uh, produced food. Another example is the intensive uh, plantation of uh, forest by Jewish National Fund, Kakal. Uh, similar is the case of Al Araqib in, in the Naqab. Um, now, having identified uh, the framework of uh, settler colonialism as a necessity to capture the reality uh, and uh, the, of the reality of land and food policies in Palestine, and being aware of how colonialism instrumentalizes uh, agriculture as a field of uh, exploiting cheap and non-professional workers, we can now address the question of food production and education in the in the context of uh, Palestinians of uh, 1948. Uh, Lana, we have two minutes left. Yeah. So if, if you uh, want to tell us about uh, what's going on any, with education, it will be great. Now, any collective uh, must have a so sovereignty over education system. Uh, and this is not our case. Uh, it, it is requisite towards practicing the right to learn about uh, our own history and identity as indivi uh, and our identities as individuals and as a, a collective and toward transforming also our reality for looking at uh, education in a critical point of view. Now food production and education goes beyond like uh, from what I said before and what I will go on to say beyond in the Palestinian context, just and it's similar to the MST, that it goes much beyond than just learning on how to grow vegetables and eating healthy. A scenario that I can think of, think of is that shows the unresolved complexity of Palestinians of Fort is, is uh, to look into what the possibilities exist uh, for those Palestinians who are very, uh, who are uh, aware for health issues and uh, eating uh, organic. And by the way, most Palestinians in, inside Israel are living in urban uh, areas uh, with not uh, a lot of access to farm uh, lands. Uh, now, if they, make the, if they want to make the choice to buy organic vegetables and fruit, there is a, a very possible option that they would go to the guy who's living in a third floor in Nazareth. He would go to the shop to buy uh, uh, the fruit, the apples, which are labeled as organic. And uh, oops, these products are, uh, were uh, from uh, the settlements, uh, from an Israeli settlement in the West Bank, a business which is flourishing in the past years uh, a lot and uh, exporting a lot to the EU. And here, if we're talking about justice in food production, it's a matter of all of us to ask, what is our responsibility uh, in this uh, whole process? Um, uh, now, okay, and here I want to finish that. My last point is that um, uh, food production and education should deal with cultural questions as well. Uh, in this respect, poetry, art, and heritage are very relevant uh, through revealing the image of uh, the, the peasant or the falah of, and of the nature we live in. We can reclaim the connection we had inherited with our sur surrounded, surrounding. We can find the solutions for agroecological agro issues that Palestinian cities are, uh, and villages suffer from due to the Israeli discriminated, discriminating laws and uh, policies. And here I want to finish. Thank you. All right, Lana, thank you so much. This was really 
fantastic and essential contribution. And I think these really, really lay connections between uh, Rafi and, and Becky um, uh, talks, I think, and we, we have an example of how we may think of, of what's needed here after following Becky's talk about um, what are we dealing here with in terms of our uh, context. I think this is really important and I, I'm really looking forward to talking with you more about this. Um, we are moving on to something a little bit different. As I said at the beginning of this um, session, this session is a joint session of education and food production that was originally two different sessions and we and i'm going to let uh, orit uh, um, present uh, with sam who was her phd student but i just want to say that the uh, our logic in inviting with sam here is we some studied something slightly different but we talked about bedouins uh, and mentioned bedouins so much and with is actually the true uh, scholars of bedouin community here and she can actually show us um, some of the lost um, and restored connection to the land um, in the case of Bedouin community um, in, in regards to water and water pollution and different issues um, than, that, uh, than food production, but related. So uh, Ori, do you want to present with some to us? And after that, if we have time in the Zoom space, uh, we can ask some questions or write or it. We, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm heading. <laughs> We some need to uh, present our work, so just yeah, yeah, uh, of course, yeah. yeah. So just one, uh, two sentences. Uh, with some Sudawi, and uh, just recently, a year ago, I finished a PhD uh, under my supervision and Professor Michael Weiss from University College of London. Uh, she will speak about part, small part of her thesis, which was part uh, distribu distributed around four research papers. And I'm very honored to uh, present to Sam uh, Sidawi, which is going very soon, hopefully, uh, to uh, postdoc uh, in, uh, in Ann Arbor. So please, with Sam. Sam, unmute yourself. With Sam, unmute yourself. Okay. So I want to share my presentation again. Uh, you hear me now? Yes, okay. Thank you, Orit. Thank you, Miri. I said before, I, I will briefly present some background about the Bedouin and their relationship with their land. Then I go over what I think about environmental education among, among in, indigenous a community. So, uh, just a minute. Oops. Okay. Uh, the Bedouin are an indigenous people and a subgroup within the Arab minority in the state of Israel with a unique cultural, historical, social, and uh, political characteristics. 66. Uh, of this population live in an unorganized village in the south of Israel in the Negev Desert. Because the Bedouin villages are not recognized by the state of Israel, they suffered from lack of basic infrastructure, like sewage, water, waste removal, and disposal. Traditionally, the Negev Bedouin had depended on semi-nomadic pastoralism, and on agriculture for their lifestyle and livelihood. They also rely directly on local natural resources for survival in a sustainable way. Their traditional lifestyle suited the characteristic of their environment and reflect their awareness of its importance in providing pasture and drinking water for both both people and li uh, livestock. Today, however, the traditional lifestyle of the Bedouin is changing significantly under the influence of modernization and urbanization. The Bedouin, like other indigenous people, now define as community in transition, which remind many traditional elements from its own history. 
but draw heavily abound elements from highly Western lifestyle of its neighborhood, with whom it's in, in continual close contact. They're now faced with many environmental and health hazards, such as waste and contaminated streams. The Bedouin village, as I mentioned before, suffered from lake waste collection and disposal. As a result, the resident of this village has been disposing of their waste themselves by burning it or dumping it in the valley. These methods have been causing a hazard for the surrounding environment, as well as putting the population nearby at a high risk of health issues. Consequence of the population included the extension of plants and native animals. Adults from the Bedouin community, whom I interview in my study, describe the nature not only a place for food, for residents, and also for pharmacy. The connection with the natural resources changed according to the change in, uh, that occur in their, uh, their place. Despite the strong sense of the place that the Bedouin expressed about the place they were in the past, the Bedouin have ambivalent and complicated sense of bliss. In one hand, they prefer to live in open, calm place, and they have a strong desire to preserve the land they inherited from their parents. They talk a lot about experience of shaping in the past and spending a great deal of time outdoors, enjoying natural landscape. On the other hand, they expressed negative feeling throughout various aspects of their day connecting to the nature, noting their fear of several potential causes of violence or injury. Blessed based education dynamic, I think, have a lot of potential to change this situation. Blessed based education aims to promote the principle of uh, environmental sustainability in the context of a blessed and community. The blessed based education approach built upon the idea of fostering connection between learnings and the places in which they live by giving them opportunities to have experience in the local natural environment. Therefore, blessed based education can enhance the student's sense of bliss. However, the students, the Bedouin students, live in polluted physical space, and it, this, place, this place is limiting factor in their ability to imagine a clean and healthy natural environment. So we needed to find a alternate, a alternate place for them to experience a healthy stream that was similar to how the one in their own uh, environment could be. The blessed best education should work hand in hand with rehabilitation projects for improving the condition of population live in contaminated environments. Sense of a place also influenced by economic and political factors that affect a blessed physical condition. In the case of my own study population, for example, the area in which they live is about undergo a massive rehabilitation project for the nearby stream and its surrounding, as well as the process of regulation of local waste disposal. The intervention exposed the students to ongoing efforts for restoring the stream and improving local infrastructure. This change in their environment situation generates the condition for students to build a new connection with the stream and connecting their expressed with feeling of hope and optimistic about the stream 
In other words, the improvement helped the student to move to one hope that the stream could be different and impact the student attitude throughout their in, uh, natural environment and their willingness to uh, action to receive it. When addressing population that export to environmental pollution, place-based education must not shy away from discussing the uh, of environmental justice. Unfortunately, this is not implemented in the local project. The Bedouin not, not just suffer from a lack of infrastructure, but also from local project and environmental education. So this project must give experience for a full range of place, social, political, economic, and environmental aspects. One uh, of primary components that is considered necessary for success in environmental education for indigenous people is the incorporation of knowledge from their own history and the transition. The uh, intergenerational of this course provided the students with familiarity with the history of local environment. In my study, for example, in the encounter between the students and the adults, the students learn about socio-environmental history of their place, gathering information about local plants and animals, gathering stories from members of their community that emphasize the traditional lifestyle and emphasize the indigenous uh, knowledge that have a range environmental practices that based on an in-depth knowledge and everyday experience with natural environment in which the Bedouins live. So the result of my own study highlighted the importance of in, uh, intergenerational discourse in develop of environmental identity and student sense of a place because of the link between values related to sustainable environmental behavior and that um, the, uh, uh, traditional values and the life of a uh, lifestyle of indigenous community. Thank you. Sam, thank you very much. Orit, do we do? Can we stick on for a couple of minutes for yes, questions or yes, free comments? Course. Okay, yes. I, I just want to say, Sam, thank you. This was um, a nice conclusion. Um, I think uh, that kind of uh, takes us back first to I think you know there is a lot of discussion in environmental education theory whether place-based education can be critical theory. It's like historical long discussions. And, and critical pedagogy and pedagogies of place. There are a lot of arguments whether uh, they can go hand in hand. And I think in the Bedouin case, we certainly see in emerging research how uh, food education in the Bedouin sector um, that becomes this realm of contestation and reclamation of land in addition to contesting their image as wasteland um, that stick with them over the years because um, of the conditions in which they live. So I think this kind of brings us together back to the way I opened this session with uh, our curiosity over many food production projects in the Bedouin sector. I want to open just uh, in case people have questions. I just want to say I have um, many of us students are watch have been watching with us from afar from one screen and they've sent me uh, over our um, group WhatsApp some <laughs> questions and comments and they said they sent thank you to all of you and we're really inspired. Um, but I, I have also a question later yeah, on. Yeah, I, I want to first let people that are here to ask questions. Yes. They said yes. they sent thank you to And also speakers who want to comment, yeah? <laughs> so Orit, you are now the manager. I'm at the hospital, so. Uh, yes, okay, okay. So who's first who wants to ask something, please? Do in the um, you can raise your hand. If not, we will start. Okay, uh, um, Rebecca, I wanted to ask something about the connection. Uh, first of all, I really enjoy your uh, book, and for me, it was really experience to read uh, new uh, theories. 
what I wanted to ask is after uh, working with Wissam for several years, we found out that some of the managers actually ask us, why you invest so much money in uh, environmental education and not in mathematics? What about literacy that will help our students to be um, incorporated in engineering, in engineering education? So I wonder, is this aspect was also revealed in, in your work as well? Miri's idea, we're gonna take, should I answer that or are we gonna take yeah. a few questions? I think so, yeah, I'll read. Yeah, please. Okay, because I also had some comments about the other speakers, yeah. so I don't know. So feel free, I think, yeah. you're not. Um, well, first of all, oh, I wanna say like absolutely, like the MST, is not, I mean, the MSC is not just trying to reproduce a, a farmer class that only knows about farming and food. I mean, how they describe it is that every young person has the right to know the knowledge that humanity has historically produced. So that includes math, science, physics, biology, literature, um, theater, the arts, right? So in every school you go with the MST, it's not just going to be about farming education. It's going to be all the disciplines and they take very seriously all the disciplines because again they talk about this right that we have to appropriate the knowledge that his, that humanity historically constructed um, and so it's not it's not just a sideline education so they definitely take that into consideration and in fact there's been sort of books about some articles or books about how the MST teaches math how they teach some of these subjects that might be harder to think through from a prairie perspective um, but they do try to connect all of the mathematical knowledge, scientific knowledge to the problems that are in local communities and issues that challenges that people want to face. Um, I didn't, since I have the floor, maybe I'll just say like two, like a, I just, it was so wonderful listening to all your presentations. I learned so much. Um, and Rafi, I actually, I teach Julie Guthman in uh, the course I teach on um, like political economy of food and agriculture. Um, and so I, I think your critique is right on, uh, similar to her critique. And I think, I think the language that I heard Lana use and the language that MST uses is not organic, right? They use this language of agroecology mm -hmm. and agroecology specifically being a class-based project that's not just about um, uh, healthy food, but it's about people having the, the, the power over their own food production through both science, it's not a rejection of science, but it's also acknowledgement of the historical ways that people have constructed um, food systems. And so when we talk about critical food systems, me and uh, one of my co-authors, David Meek, we often talk about in four quadrants. We talk about agroecology, um, food justice, like the food justice movement, which could be connected to the climate justice movement, popular education, like prairie education. And then we talk about food sovereignty as like a critical fourth piece. And I can't think of a more important term for like Palestine and think through Palestinian education as this question of sovereignty. So sovereignty is like critical in that. Um, and David, I just, like, I think your point, David, is that, I don't know if he's still here. Oh, he is still here. Um, just like social movements, social movements are critical, right? It can't just be an individual project, but social movements themselves are the critical form that change is going to take. I'm glad that you thought that contestation collaboration framework was really helpful. Um, but I think what you're doing with the climate justice movement is really inspiring. Um, and then I also think like wisdom, this idea of place-based education, you're using a different language, but it really sounds like you're using this language of like land-based education and the importance of historical consciousness. And so like, like the MSC also focuses on this idea that we have to understand the history of working class struggles in order to understand where we've come from and where we're going. And so that historical consciousness that it sounds like these programs are trying to promote is critical. Um, and the last thing I'll say to Lana is that the MSC is an internationalist movement, right? So um, the MST explicitly supports the Palestinian struggle for sovereignty. And there's tons of exchanges between MST activists that go to Palestine, Palestinian activists that go to Brazil. Um, in many schools, there's a writing project between uh, children in the MST and children from Palestine where they exchange letters about their experiences because the MST sees like their struggle as connected to the struggle for Palestinian sovereignty. Um, so that's just an interesting connection. And the last thing I'll say is that I think, I think what all the panel, the presentation showed is this relationship between method, strategy, and goal. So I think we all agree that like one method has to be education, has to be critical pedagogy, um, because we don't want to be followers. We want to create organic intellectuals in the community and education is critical. 
And our strategy has to be movements. It can't be individuals, but we need social movements and collective ad action. And our goal is not simply like better food, organic food in the capitalist system, but rather these big goals of agroecology, sovereignty, and climate justice. So what I got from all of our presentations is this connection between method, strategy, and goal. So thank you, thank you all. Thank you so thank much. You. It was like, we couldn't ask for a better uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> Um, so questions, yeah. guys. We have two I, I have two questions from people okay. who participated here. Uh, one was uh, uh, for Becky and one was for Lana. Um, Becky, for you, the students in my class watched Occupy the Farm and they asked uh, if, if that's the movement. I was telling them that it was at some point connected to MST. So it's a question about did MST movement also um, inspired uh, people in the kind of more Western world or what we call the global South or people in, in urban, uh, this is an ur urban US occupied farm. Um, so is, is there any connections and influences um, with kind of first world class-based more movement or race-based movement, things like this? The question for Lana was, is there, are there um, food education or food sovereignty initiative in, the Pal in Palestine or in the Palestinian sectors in Israel? Okay, so Becky, maybe you go first because you just, you're, or, and then Lana can ask her or whoever wants to answer first. <laughs> well, I'll be really brief that, yes, the MST is an inspiration all over the world, right? Both indirectly and directly. So the Occupy the Farm movement, which was a group of community members in the Bay Area that occupied a, a five acre piece of land to keep it from being turned into a parking lot. Like they were explicitly studying the MST. The MST wrote like a letter of solidarity for their day, like their occupation they had that day. And so there are those lines of communication. Um, but there's also more direct like inspirations in terms of the MST runs these international political education programs. And they've been doing them for 15 years in Spanish for the Latin American community. So like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Latin American activists have gone to Sao Paulo and studied with the MST and return to their communities. But over the past six years, they also developed this political education program, which is nine weeks in English. Um, and so like there's been Palestinian activists, activists from South Africa, other parts of Asia um, and the United States. Like they invite, you know, five or six people from the US because they realize the US does have a working class movement that's different than our government um, uh, and Canada. So there's also been these sort of direct connections. And I would say for US, US activists, it's like the the collective pedagogy of the MST is so hard for them because individualism is so strong, even in our activist communities. So while I see like Palestinian activists sort of thriving in the MST's collectivist culture, I see US activists really struggling, um, which is an interesting uh, mm -hmm. uh, take on where we are politically, right? Mm -hmm. so thank you for the question. Lana, <laughs> unmute yourself. Uh, well, actually, I could, uh, I will answer uh, your question, uh, continuing the point that uh, Rebecca mentioned about the connection between the method and the strategy and the movement itself. In Palestine, either in the West Bank or uh, inside the Green uh, Line, there are many initiatives. These initiatives, they come from individuals or uh, um, organizations such as uh, such the NGOs uh, and each one is working uh, with the, with his own uh, or uh, with the group's resources uh, but unfortunately in the Palestinian case and this is why I see as a Palestinian it's a must to learn about the MST that we're lacking this um, strategy uh, this social uh, movement, uh, where the work is not done as individuals, where we can develop our methods, where we can, as I said in my uh, small uh, talk, that we need to address, especially in education, and this is the forum, how to, to change the, our colonized uh, consciousness uh, uh, as Palestinians uh, in connection to the land and working the land. And unfortunately, when we have the, when we are lacking the access uh, to land, when there's still the policies of confiscation land just to, uh, in the last uh, year, um, and today it was in the, again in the news about the confiscations of the lands in Shfamer, uh, 
uh, which is a town in the north, I mean, you will find educational programs uh, quite uh, like the universal one, but have nothing to do with the Palestinian case. Mm -hmm. I mean, to go to a school and uh, to establish and to build a, a vegetable garden and to learn how to grow tomatoes mm -hmm. and when to grow tomatoes and what to do if we want to uh, plant it in winter. But this is not like it is a need it is uh, super important but this is not the beginning we need to in, we need the uh, like a social movement that takes puts everything together fights our image on what does it mean to be uh, fallah uh, that it's not dirty it's not non professional it's not cheap hands uh, in order for the children to reconnect now in uh, Saida's uh, lecture, and also Rafi mentioned this about uh, like uh, the connection between uh, us, the Arabs, the Palestinians, to nature and our surroundings. Now, when we go to villages, there's no really surroundings, and it's fi filled with uh, with garbage that the Israeli go government doesn't uh, put po uh, budget and doesn't really deal with it. And it's also, but I think most important, and here I want to talk about the, to, again, to talk about the consciousness. And this is what many initiatives are dealing with, with is that we're lacking the, the connection, the, the, the sense of uh, uh, control and the sovereignty over the land. And when you have this, you have this um, feeling of this is something fire, this is not mine. And this is uh, something that, it, like uh, the food production education, would give us uh, uh, a, a true one, a critical one, would give us the the opportunity to develop our methods and our ways, and our s space in order to deal with all these uh, questions. I, I want to say thank you. I, I just wanted to highlight one thing that we all ignored, but uh, at least in the, in the Bedouin research that we are conducting, it's very, it's very significant, this gender, um, is gender roles within these transformation, at least in the Bedouin sector, you know, farmer, falah sounds a very masculine identity, but what we see in the Bedouin sector, actually, that this is food production of women, and it actually creates an immense change in terms of the political activism um, and political identity of Bedouin women. So there is a lot of a, a transformation in gender role at this articulation of informal food economy and food production and um, a, lots of new roles and new identities emerge in this uh, process. And in the Bedouin sector, it's, it's definitely a Falahin women now <laughs> that do the actual food growth who become in the context of uh, more political food education, also political activist, which is really um, uh, interesting. I don't know if we summon any, uh, has anything to do with this, but um, um, but that's interesting. Uh, we Sam, do you have any observation about this in terms of the Bedouin society? Uh, actually, I don't know about uh, women and farming in the Bedouin society, uh, but I think. Uh, uh, one, one of my interview said we don't have now a land to to farming actually and that the, they have a limited space now mm -hmm. but uh, I don't know about what uh, the project that you mentioned before mm -hmm. okay so any more questions before we have to evacuate the space? <laughs> Rafi. Yeah, I, I would like to ask um, maybe all of you, but specifically uh, Rebecca, because you framed so nice the four categories, the way that we look at critical food in general, and you mentioned the food sovereignty, the food justice. One, one notion that I've been struggling quite a lot, and, and again, it's more of the theoretical, and it's more comes from my thinking about the project, is the notion of food democracy. And I, I, I wanted to, to maybe to ask, I'm directing my question to Rebecca, but it might be an open question to anyone that has some idea of the theoretical understanding of this notion, how, how does food democracy might be 
related or implemented maybe to the MST or other project that we can see here in Israel and Palestine. So I'm, I'm really curious about this notion. So I guess my question back would be, how do you see like the difference mm -hmm. between food sovereignty and food democracy? The idea of food sovereignty is that you would have communities that are self-governing themselves and producing their food in agroecological, sustainable ways that are appropriate to their cultural and healthful, uh, healthy practices. Um, and, 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 dem and direct democracy is like a key aspect of food sovereignty. So I guess I would ask you, like, how do you see this between food sovereignty and food democracy? <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm still struggling with the definition, and I'm, I'm not sure that it's that important. But sometimes when 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 you get a good definition of a notion, it might open your eyes into one goals or kind of like we talked about. I think that David mentioned political possibilities. So I think that if we define clearly what exactly is that we are looking for and what is the difference between sovereignty or, or democracy or justice or equity, uh, th th that might be important. Probably these all notions are part of the same whole goal that we, we are looking for. So I'm, I'm just struggling with this notion for, for quite a while. I mean, the only thing I would say is democracy is like that tricky concept, right? Like democracy is used for so many different political projects which is right. why I prefer this term of sovereignty or, right. or, or what the MSC calls grassroots popular democracy, mm -hmm. which has a different connotation than democracy itself. Right. Um, can I take, can I David, do you want to say something about that? Uh, yeah, I, wanted to, I, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, it's an important concept and um, I was wondering what the governance structure of uh, MST is. Is it, mm -hmm. it I mean, I, I think what we're seeing in a lot of, um, in the Israel protest movement, we're seeing a great deal of subsidiarity, a great deal of grassroots, um, no leader, no one centralized leadership. And that is um, in some ways, I think a new, new thing for Israel, um, a good thing for Israel perhaps. Um, I wonder how, what, what, are there parallels that you could talk about? I mean, that's a kind of, Way, a way in to look at, at food democracy as well, but not, not just on the food level. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'll speak, I mean, yeah, you could talk for like hours and hours about the MSC's internal democracy, internal democratic structure. I mean, it, it has been critiqued for um, having uh, some tendencies towards democratic centralism um, in the sense that uh, they, you know, like local communities are following the sort of political lines that are built at the national level. But the, I mean, the, the, basic, the basic way that the MSC functions is this idea of collective leadership. So there's never like one person at any level that makes the decisions, but there's always a collective of folks at every single level. So at like the occupation level, like within an occupation of a thousand people, every single family is in a collective of 10 families, which they call base nucleus. And that base nucleus will send one representative to a, a camp coordinating collective, which is the nether collective body, which makes decisions with the camp. And the camp will send a, a representatives. And they're not representatives in the democratic representative sense, because they're really just trying to socialize the conversation that had at that other collective in the other collective. Um, and so the camp will send it to a regional, the regional will send it to a state, the state will send it to the national. And so you have these collective bodies at every level. And what they call, what they say is, is that they call it an ascending and descending democracy. So the conversation starts at the base nucleus, goes up to the top. Then there's, if there's, a, if there's any decision that affects people's lives at the uh, sort of at these other levels, the conversation has to go back down, right? And you see that prefigured within the school system in terms of students being part of these base nucleus, nucleus structures. And what this means that like, what it means basically is if you're gonna uh, make class end two hours early on a Friday, it takes a lot, a long time to make the decision because every single collective has a debate and then it goes to a coordinating collective and makes a decision, but then it comes back down. Um, and so it's a, it's a lot of meetings. <laughs> Direct democracy entails a lot of collective meetings, um, but this idea of collective leadership is super critical. I also just wanna speak to Miri's point because like gender is a central focus, not, I mean, 
it could have been a more of a focus, but it's a central point I try to make in my book about gender. Like the degree to which bringing youth into a school and then saying to young boys, you have to wash dishes and clean the bathroom just like the women, like that type of, uh, of transformation of who's doing this reproductive labor in the school is really critical. It was also critical that when the MST started engaging in public education, like that was a feminized sector, right? That was women's work. And honestly, in, in Brazil, it ended up being the work of gay men, LGBT folks. Um, and so the majority of women and, um, and gay men in the MST actually began their activism through the school system, the education sector, and then they went on to take other leadership roles, right? And so the MST, by focusing on like a feminized sort of sector school systems, they were able to create this, um, what the MST calls this entry door for women and LGBT folks to actually rise in leadership. And so that's just really, really critical about what, what, you're, what you're doing as a movement because this idea of like political education and farming, like they're so masculine, right? Versus childcare is feminized. Um, that's yeah. just a point, a gender point. Well, guys, I, I, this is fascinating, but we, we do have to finish this session. I just wanted to say, you'll have to read the book and I promise you, I'm going to read Rafi, Wissam, you are all part of my curriculum and Lana is already in the know that she's coming to speak to my students. Um, and we don't teach in Zoom. So, and Becky, we'll have to bring you over to all of our multiple communities at some point, because this was really inspiring. And thank you so much. I think we made a big significant step in just entering, you know, bringing the Israeli-Palestinian Bedouin context into a place with connections we don't usually make in the Israeli, um, you know, scholar um, scene. So I think this was a major step for us, Becky, and I, I thank you for that. And, um, and uh, um, thanks for all of you who stayed and sticked with us for such a long time. And you have each other emails and our emails if you want to reconnect in the future. And, and good I want night. To say more uh, personally, Miri, for the months of work she invested <laughs> in this uh, <laughs> workshop from an hospital in from gender hospital. issues. I don't know many researchers that will uh, coordinate um, from an hospital. So I'm, I'm in Soroka. You. I'm in the Soroka hospital. Yeah, really. the best <laughs> hospital of the desert Israel. Yeah. So thank you all.